Undertale is a visually simplistic game in the style of classic RPG titles such as Earthbound and was developed independently by Toby Fox. In early May of 2013, Fox sent a short demo of the game to the site Fangamer and they streamed the event on Twitch. The demo was met with mostly positive reviews and a public demo was then later released as well. In June of the same year, Fox decided to launch a Kickstarter campaign to get some additional funding to make a full game out of this demo. The campaign ended up receiving over 10 times as much as the $5,000 goal. Initially, the game was supposed to be around 2 hours long with each area taking roughly 15 minutes to traverse, but the final game ended up being over 3 times as long. He stated that he did basically everything on his own except for some of the artwork as he did not want to rely on anybody else. Fox anticipated a mid-2014 release but soon realized that that would not be possible so the game had to be delayed. He spent an additional year and a half working on the game and on September 15, 2015, Undertale was finally released and subsequently met with critical acclaim across the board. While the story of the game is entirely told via text, just like the classic RPGs the game was inspired by, two characters could be said to have an actual speaking voice of their own. If you choose the genocide route and fight and or kill everyone you encounter, you'll soon run into Flowey, and after a short conversation, this voice clip is played. The only other character to have any sort of audible speech is Metaton, and it occurs when he's transforming into Metaton X. Oh, yes. During a stage in Waterfall, there's a puzzle in which you have to build a bridge using flowers. If you ignore the puzzle and instead take the flowers to the bottom right of the screen, it's possible to access a hidden area. Here you'll find a bench with a quiche laying underneath, which seems to be a reference to a couple of tweets made by the creator of Homestuck and his brother. What's interesting about the flower bridge puzzle, though, is that there's another abandoned area known as Room Water 13, which also requires you to build a bridge of flowers. And if you do, you're taken to yet another abandoned stage with these strange-looking red things. Was this intentionally left for us to find, or it's all very clouded in mystery? When you encounter the enemy Lesser Dog, the easiest and most common strategy is to simply pet him once and then spare him. However, it's possible to continue to pet him for several minutes until his neck is stretched across the screen twice, at which point the screen prompts, Lesser Dog is gone where no dog has gone before. <laughs> Doing this will also erect these long-necked Lesser Dog sculptures. In Hotland, Sans can be found selling hot dogs and hot cats, which uh, you can buy. If you attempt to purchase a hot dog when your inventory is full, however, he will start stacking them on your head. This continues until you're balancing a tower of 29 hot dogs. If you go to Papyrus and Sans' house, you'll find Papyrus standing to the left side of the living room. If you walk to the kitchen, he will come over to ask you what you're doing. When you exit the kitchen again, he'll walk back to his usual position. However, if you walk in and out of the kitchen repeatedly at a rapid pace, he starts moving back and forth in an attempt to keep up with you. If you then talk to him again, he will mention that he can't feel his legs because of it. If you play the pacifist route and reach the end credits, you'll get to play one last minigame in which you have to dodge the names of all the Kickstarter backers. Doing so will grant you access to the mysterious door in Snowden Forest. The room beyond the door doesn't have any clear purpose and is likely nothing more than a fun easter egg as a reward for completing the game. For example, we know that the dog is meant to represent Toby Fox and the items in the room jokingly reveals that the dog accidentally programmed the entire game by barking. But uh, then again, this game is known to be infested with secrets and hidden clues, so I feel like we're missing something. Wait a minute. How could we miss this? It can't be. Illuminati! You've come to take control! 
What's really interesting about the character Sans is that he's one of the few characters who seem to be aware of the existence of different timelines, as well as you, the player, or at the very least the player's actions. When he tells jokes, he doesn't look at the player character, he looks directly at the screen at the player. In fact, he may even realize that he's inside a video game, as indicated by the so-called dirty hacker ending, which occurs when you've modified the game too much. <laughs> Then there's the final battle with Sans at the very end of the genocide route, in which this conversation takes place. The very first word is interesting because he says our reports. In other words, he is or was working with someone who may know just as much as himself. He also realizes that you are responsible for the anomalies in the timelines, caused by you saving, loading and even restarting the game entirely. Once he understands that his life and everyone else's are in the hands of someone else, he feels so utterly powerless that they seem to develop a sort of nihilism which other characters like his brother simply misconstrue as laziness. He also exhibits strange abilities like teleportation during this scene. Or it could also be that he's able to freeze and or manipulate time, which he seems to be doing in this scene. He frequently skips several areas by using shortcuts and his brother Papyrus makes a few comments regarding his abilities. Then there's also the fact that the shopkeeper in Snowden tells you that the two brothers just showed up one day, and that the town has gotten more interesting since. At the end of the day, it's really anyone's best guess as to how Sans really fits into the overall story. If you check the official website for the game and then inspect the website's HTML code, you'll find a hidden message that reads, What are you doing? Looking for secrets? Don't put your nose where it doesn't belong, or you might learn something you don't like. In a similar fashion, when looking through the game files, you can find a sound file which has this to say. Hello, <laughs> have some respect and don't spoil the game. It's impossible to have mysteries nowadays. Because of nosy people like you. Please keep all of this between us. If you post it online, I won't make any more secrets. No one will be impressed. It will be your fault. <laughs> oh. Good thing I kept this between us, then, if by us you mean you, me, and uh, my viewers. That's an us, you can define us that way. So yeah, th this is not my fault. I, I didn't upload this file, I kept the secret between us. Isn't that right, Frisk? You done fucked up now! W.D. Gaster if you play the game normally, you're probably not familiar with this name. It refers to a mysterious character which is almost never seen nor mentioned until you edit the game files. His only appearance occurs within a well-hidden room. You can't interact with him and it's unclear if this truly is Gaster because the sprite of this character is only known as Mystery Man. Then there's three other characters known in the game files as G Follower 1, 2 and 3.
From these encounters, we learned that Gaster was the royal scientist before Alphys who replaced him. We also learned that he created the core and then presumably disappeared as he fell into his creation. This brings us to the true lab. Within this laboratory, you can find these entries written by Alphys. They range from 1 to 21, but entry number 17 seems to be missing. That is until you yet again modify the game files to gain access to a hidden section containing this message written in strange symbols. The symbols comes from a font known as Wingdings and once transcribed into plain English reveals this message. Entry number 17. Dark, darker, yet darker. The darkness keeps growing. The shadows cutting deeper. Photon readings negative. This next experiment seems very, very interesting. What do you two think? This all but confirms that WD Gaster stands for Wing Dings Gaster. However, some prefer to believe that his full name is Wing Din Gaster, as there's another font known as Aster, thus creating a portmanteau of the two font names. And when Sans falls asleep at the end of the genocide route, the letters appear to be using the Aster typeface. Furthermore, there's a family of flowers known by the name of Asterisei, more commonly referred to by the abbreviation Aster. This family just happens to include daisies, sunflowers and buttercups, which could be relevant given how important yellow and golden flowers are to the main storyline. Coincidence or not, who knows. Anyway, why Gaster's full name is so important is because of the two characters Papyrus and Sans who get their names from the two typefaces Papyrus and Comic Sans, which they also use to communicate. This likely means that they are related in some way and could indicate that the two mentioned at the end of the entry number 17 message refers to Papyrus and Sans. But there's more. At a specific area in Snowden, it's possible to receive a call with the unknown caller asking for someone whose name begins with the letter G. That someone could possibly be Gaster. There's a hidden stage called Sound Test in which you can play four different loops. One of them is called Gaster's Theme. None of these four melodies are included anywhere else in the game nor in the official soundtrack. If you name your character Gaster in the beginning, the game will restart for some reason. When you gain access to Sans' room, you'll find a silver key that unlocks a door hidden behind a house. In this room, there's a blueprint on the wall with strange symbols that seem to relate to some kind of machine. The symbols could be wingdings written by Gaster, but it's hard to tell. In a room known as Room Water Redacted, you'll find a character that simply says Redacted in wingdings. And while it's important to consider all of this, let's not forget that it's not even clear if Gaster is really important to the story or not, because after all, you will only access most of this information by manually modifying the game. You can play through the game several times over without ever knowing that there's a character by this name. I know this because that's exactly what I did. I played through the game four times to try all the different routes and before doing any type of research, and not not once did I encounter any of the things I've mentioned regarding Gaster. Isn't it quite likely that this Gaster character was cut from the game and we're only finding the leftovers? I mean, that games contain hidden information that's been forgotten during development is nothing strange, it happens all the time. For example, the entry number 17 message left by Gaster is not the only entry numbered 17. If you search through the game files, you will find another entry with the number 17, likely written by Alphys, that reads, Monsters' physical forms can't handle determination like humans can. With too much determination, our bodies begin to break down. Everyone's melted together. This piece of dialogue seems to have been cut from the game as it's never displayed during normal gameplay and is similar but not the same to what Alpha says at the end of the True Lab stage.
With all this said, what still gives Undertale such credence is that it continually breaks the fourth wall and things like saving and loading game files can actually have an effect on the in-game storyline. Normal game mechanics that are normally meant as tools for the player are in this game used as important plot devices. So it wouldn't be the biggest stretch of the imagination that digging through the game files could actually be a part of the gameplay.